Ready to get started? Yeah. Cool. Welcome back. Um, our first speaker of the day, our first non-keynote, sorry, speaker <laughs> of the day is Chris LeBlanc from GNS Science talking to us about Cython. Cool. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. So the talk I'm going to give is getting the benefits of C without leaving Python. All right, let's get right into it because there's a ton of slides to cover. Myself, I have a background in earth sciences, which is really just geology with uh, a peppering of some other stuff like environmental science and a background in geophysics. I've been using Python since roughly 2001. Uh, I'm now a software developer for, for GNS Science working on something called Globe Claritas. We do a bunch of seismic processing and you would instantly think earthquakes and I wouldn't blame you. But this is more active seismic, so running seismic surveys and, and processing the uh, you know, tens of terabytes or even more that can, can be generated from that. So we need lots of efficient code, which is generally a lot of C code sometimes even a bit of Fortran. So what is Cython? Well, Cython is a fork of Pyrex. Uh, well, what is Pyrex? Pyrex is a tool that makes uh, C extension modules very easy to write. It's pretty much just like writing a normal Python, really. Uh, the main author of Pyrex was Greg Ewing from, from here, believe it or not, University of Canterbury, uh, quite some time ago. It gives you all sorts of advantages, even just doing the one simple switch converting from Python to a, a, a C extension in, in uh, Cython can sometimes give you a 50% speed increase just on its own without adding additional uh, features. It also acts as a very good uh, bridge between the Python world and the C world. Since uh, you're creating C code on your own, you can actually call C functions directly, which isn't something you can do in standard Python. You can also go the other direction. You can run Cython functions directly from C, which is, I don't have time to cover it, but it's a, it's a very useful thing. All right, let's get into the demos here. So here's a very, very simple demo uh, straight from the Python 2 documentation. It's Python 2, sorry. <laughs> uh, all the demos I have here work on Python 2 and 3. Uh, but if you see this little function here, it's just doing a very simple try accept block there. And that's only, what, five, six lines or so? Now, whoa, here's the, uh, here's the C code that implements it. And that's not even all of it. There's some more, and there's some more. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through this code because it's, it's kind of nasty. But you can see we have to use things like this pi object get item. That's part of the uh, Python C API. You have to check for any errors. You have to worry about uh, all your uh, reference counting, so you have to manually increase and decrease reference counts, and you have to know when, when to do this and when not to do it. It's all pretty bad. So if we can get away from this and stay in Python, that would be a much better thing. And that's what Cython gives us. So it's, I won't go through all these bullet points, but it's, it's mainly Python. It gives you excellent compatibility between Python 2 and 3. You get all those things you're used to, like uh, garbage collection and, and string handling. It does some really useful things such as uh, conversions between Python types and C types. So in Python, an in integer, it doesn't really have uh, you know, a, a specific size to it. It has sort of arbitrary precision, whereas C has uh, types of very definite sizes. So Cython will handle a lot of that automatic conversion for us. It creates code that can compile on pretty much any compiler, stable and mature. So it might not be quite as, uh, as sexy as some of these new uh, uh, JIT compiled approaches, but it's, it's definitely a, a robust way to do it. The disadvantages are, since it's not you know, uh, done at runtime, you need to compile it first. Uh, this usually boils down to using something like distutils, which is uh, not the best. <laughs> I'm not the first one to say I don't like distutils. Uh, and it is C, C Python specific, so this won't work on things like uh, PyPy or Iron Python or, or some of those. So why don't we get into it again and uh, just convert a, a very simple function, uh, Python function, into a Cython function. So here, this is you know, a pretty simple thing. This is kind of as simple as, as Python code gets. We're just setting a variable x equals to 0 and then incrementing it through this thing called count. And there's no, there's no defined types on this one. So let's. Let's add some. 
So we're using the cdef keyword to declare that x is an integer. And this isn't a, a Python integer. This is a C integer. So uh, this, is, this is no longer an immutable type like you have in Python. In Python, if you say x equals 1, uh, that's immutable. You can't modify it. And if later on you say x equals 2, it's actually discarding the old value and uh, applying a new one to it. This is different. It actually modifies it in place. And integers can be different sizes on different platforms. So it's, it's more of the C world that you have to be aware of. But as long as you're aware of that and have some knowledge of C, it's, uh, it's very powerful. And so all we did there was one small change. And this will vastly increase it, your performance. I'll go into some examples of that later. Now, what if we want to make this a complete Cython function? So in the internals, if you looked at the C code, this would actually just be a, a C function. So we're, we're declaring that the, the function itself uh, takes an integer and returns an integer. And we still have cdef int x equals 0, but at the end, we're returning x, which is also an integer. So th this would be very familiar to anyone that's done a bit of C. Uh, it's a little bit unusual for Python, but th this new pep that we talked about at the keynote sort of introduces uh, some typing to, to Python as well. So it's, it's, it's a bit in line with that, that sort of thing. And so how do you build this? So the files I've, sh I've shown you so far, they're still really just Python files. And these have a, a .pyx extension on them. So to convert that, basically to compile that to a, to a C file, you just run the Cython command on it. And so you, you can do that manually. But what is usually done is to use uh, disutils or setup tools with a setup.py file. And you just use the, the build ext infrastructure that exists in Python to do all the, all the hard work for you. So things like compi compile flags and, and all that is largely taken care of. But you can, uh, you can override that if you want to. And we build in place just so we have the, the shared object where we want it. All right, so that's the, uh, the groundwork out of the way. Now here's my sort of impression of, uh, of Python and the global interpreter box. So for those of you who don't know, uh, we do have threading in Python, but anytime you're using it and modifying your typical Python object, it's gonna, gonna lock that interpreter so only one thread can run at a time. So if you're running a for loop, it's gonna, it's gonna run that only, only that for loop and until that's done, and then it might let the other threads do their thing. So it's really not much better than running things in serial. So wouldn't it be nice if we could get around that? There's actually a lot of modules that do already in the uh, C, uh, Python standard library. So things like time.sleep, that's a very simple one that releases it. Most of NumPy releases it, because most of NumPy is implemented in C. And there's lots of other C extensions that do as well. So how do we, how do, we do this? Because you can't normally just disable the, the gil from Python. But using the syntax here, this with no gil, that lets us disable it. So at that point, things running in parallel, even just using standard Python threading, will actually work uh, at the same time. So you'll get, you'll get a speed up like you would expect to get with multi-threading. Now, there are some caveats with this. And that is that uh, you basically can't modify any Python object in here. And so that's a, that's a bit of a bad one. So as long as you're dealing with Cython C style uh, objects and variables, you'll be fine. But if you need to modify some sort of Python state, you have to ensure that you reacquire this global in interpreter lock. And so that's done in a very similar way. You just say with gil. And so in this example here, we're just uh, seeing if a, a certain condition uh, happens. So maybe it's an error state from some C code or something. And to raise a, an exception, you can't do that, since that's, again, part of the, the Python Python world. You can't do that without reacquiring the guilt. So we do that and raise the exception. And there is a bit of uh, checking by the, the Cython compiler. So if you do something that's not quite right, it'll typically let you know. So why do we stay away from threading in the first place? Well, there's all sorts of problems here. Race conditions, deadlocks, uh, data corruption. Uh, even just implementing threading itself is a bit of a pain with thread pools and, and things like that. 
So wouldn't it be nice if there was a simpler way to, to do this? Well, there is. And here's a very complex looking diagram from Wikipedia. So this is describing OpenMP. And how many, uh, hands up, how many people here have heard of OpenMP? So maybe a half or a third of the audience. So I'm not terribly surprised because we're Python programmers. Why would, we, uh, why would we look into this? But OpenMP is, it's a C, C and Fortran uh, uh, multi-threading API N spec. So it's, uh, it's pragma based. So what looks like comments in your code actually direct the compiler uh, how to execute certain tasks in parallel. And so on the upper section there, we see uh, these parallel tasks. That upper one is executing things serially. So it's fairly simple. It's doing ABC and ABCD. But the one beneath it, that's where it's doing things in parallel, as you would expect a typical sort of parallel program to do. The advantage of OpenMP is that it abstracts a lot of this pain away from you, if you do it correctly. <laughs> so I'm going to look at that in a few minutes, just in relation to Cython, and, and see how that works. And I, I sort of, I was dabbling around with this for quite a while to find a, a good benchmark that would that would show uh, how Cython can speed things up without getting too complex, and you know, still touching on the the aspects I needed to touch on. So I sort of fell on this uh, 2D Laplace equation. Uh, it was first done in 2004 by Prabhu Ramachandran. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, that was uh, further sort of updated by Travis Oliphant in 2011. So they previously compared all these things here. So NumPy, uh, Fortran, MATLAB, Octave, all sorts of stuff. Um, I'll discuss a few additional ones, sort of newer ones. So I'll, I'll discuss Python itself, because that's the, the standard. Uh, PyPy with its just-in-time compilation. NumPy again. Numba, which is a, a very interesting one. Cython, Cython wrapping C, and Cython running in parallel. So here's a very simple diagram. Uh, the 2D Laplace equation, for each element, it iterates over in the entire array. So a big 2D array. Uh, it takes uh, four surrounding neighboring elements. So it's a fairly, uh, I suppose, I.O., not really I.O., uh, memory intensive algorithm. And it, uh, it, I think it's a reasonable benchmark for this sort of thing. It's uh, typical in terms of the sort of things scientists would, would do on NumPy arrays. And so here's the starting state. The entire 2D array is all zeros except for the upper row, where those are set to 1. And this is all 64-bit uh, uh, floating point. So there is it after 10 iterations, 100, 1,000, and 10,000. So you can see what's happening here. It's almost like diffusion of, of heat. But don't ask me, because I'm not really a mathematician, per se. <laughs> so why don't we uh, have a look at the various implementations and see what sort of speed ups they give us. So this one is the, the naive Python approach here. Uh, let's see if my cursor works. Yeah, it does. So down here, we've got the work array. Uh, for those of you ha that haven't seen NumPy in action, this is uh, a way of creating a 2D NumPy array. Uh, that's all filled with zeros. And then this step here, it looks like we're only ac accessing one element, but we're actually saying the entire row, that upper row is equal to one. And then we run this function up, whoops, up here. So for x in range 100. So it's an iterative approach, and it, it modifies this array in place. And up here, this is the standard sort of algorithm you see on those, those previous two uh, blog posts. I'm really not a fan of variables like i and j and, and u, but uh, I thought I'd, I'd stick with their implementation as well, just to keep things simple. And it is very in line with the, uh, the equation itself. So it, it makes sense. All right, and here's the first benchmark. So this is Python. And as you would expect, this is, this is going to be the slowest one. You might wonder why I chose the scale on that upper graph there. The, uh, That'll make more sense later as we see various other implementations coming in. So the, these are graphing the same thing. The upper graph is just a linear graph, and the lower one is a log-log graph. And so that shows uh, different behaviors better. This, this shows 
the behavior of smaller arrays much better. So we'll see that later on. So I mentioned PyPy and it's just in time compiler. Uh, so this one here gives us a, a, an order of magnitude speed improvement without changing the code at all. So that's, that's not bad. We see this little, little hiccup there. That's actually just the, the JIT warm-up. OK, then there's the NumPy version. I only have five minutes, so I've got to move my butt. So uh, the NumPy version eliminates all the loops and makes it, uh, uses this so-called vectorized optimization, or not oper optimizing, operation to perform this, the same sort of uh, operation on this array. Unfortunately, it creates several temporary arrays. So if you're working on you know, a, a massive array, you might find you run out of memory. So this gives us a, a huge Im improvement on the order of two orders of magnitude. OK, so then we move on to Numba. So Numba is this new thing. It uses the LLVM, or low level vir virtual machine that lots of things are using, like, uh, like Julia, that other language. So all we have to do is decorate this function. Whoops. So it's very, very similar, pretty much identical to the Python version, except we decorate it with this JIT, and we get this, this huge speed up, especially for, uh, for small arrays. It does very well. And again, we see the, the JIT warm up for that first data point. Now we have the Cython version. So this is, again, very similar to our Python version, except we use the cdef int for the, uh, the i and j variables that we're using to loop over. And apart from that, it's pretty much identical. I've included a couple of decorators here that help performance a little bit. We just turn off some of the safety. This is the setup.py file, that composite. I don't think I have time to talk about that. And so that's, yeah? OK, cool. All right, so the setup.py file we use to compile from the C code to a, a shared object in Linux or DLL on Windows. Uh, the magic all happens here in this siphonize command. Apart from that, it's all just very simple, relatively simple, very, very standard uh, disutils approaches here. So this creates a, an extension module called demos in this case. All right. And that gives us the purple graph we see down here. And so that's very similar to Numba. And I'm actually very impressed by Numba's performance here. So that's Cython, which is very similar to C. But why don't we see how fast this runs if we just wrap a C function that we already have? And so this is something we do a lot at my job, because we have you know, oodles and oodles of C code that's very optimized and has been running for, for many years. So it would be foolish to just throw it away. So what we do here, it's very similar to including a .h file in a, in a bit of C code. This is Cython syntax. We say cdef extern from, and then give it the header file we have. And so that does a bit of type checking for us. And then we, uh, we specify the, the function prototype there. And here's the, the function that actually does it. So here's how we declare that our u object is a numpy array, or nd array as they call it. Then we've got other variables. We don't actually give them a type here because it, it handles the, the type conversion on its own. So then we run this c function directly. So unlike c types, we don't have to declare input types and you know, response types, since it's really just a c code, uh, a c function call at this, at this stage. And this is an interesting way of getting the pointer to that NumPy array, the first element in it, since it's really just a contiguous amount of C memory as far as this thing is concerned. So we do the ampersand 0, 0, which is very C-ish. And then we pass in the shape and other variables. OK, there's the C code. Enough said. <laughs> uh, then we get on to the, the Cython C wrapper. So the, the only real difference here is we're including this, this .c file. If it's just a simple C file without any other dependencies, we can just stick it in there. And Python can compile it for us. And again, it's, it's right on that sort of lower curve. So it's, it's up with the fastest of them. It's only slightly faster than the Cython version. 
OK, so let's get on to something a little more interesting here, the uh, Cython parallel. So the, the parallel aspect of Cython, there's only two things you, you really use as a user. There's the, the parallel directive. So anything inside a parallel block is local to that thread, so sort of thread local buffers. And then there's P range. So P range uses OpenMP that I mentioned earlier to spawn multiple threads and have things run in parallel. It also does lots of other sort of trickery for us, so in terms of synchronization and, and things like that. If you really want to get a bit more low level, you can use the OpenMP module in Cython. So if, for example, you wanted the number of threads, that's how you would do it. And that's just a, a wrapper to, to OpenMP and, and their API. So this is almost identical to our previous Cython version. The only change here is I've replaced an X range with a P range. And I had to say no gil equals true. So anything inside this for loop uh, is not allowed to uh, modify a Python object. Or if it does, you have to reacquire the, the global interpreter lock. And in this case, we're, we're just modifying this NumPy array. And that is a, a Python object, but it's really just a C buffer as far as this is concerned. So let's see the, the response here. We can see we get on the order of, I think it's 3.2 times faster with uh, a four core machine. That's most likely because it's, it's not really an algorithm that's, that's perfectly suited towards being run in parallel. If you had something that was embarrassingly parallel, you'd probably get even better performance. Down here, we can see there's a bit of a, a hitch there. It, it's always there, no matter what. Uh, and at, at small array sizes, you can see the performance actually drops off quite a bit. But that's because it's running on four threads. Programmatically, you can say, you know, if such and such condition, then let's just use one, one thread. And so if you do that, you get your standard C serial performance again. Whoop. OK. So what if you need more performance? Well, you can mess around with compiler flags. All right. I, I don't recommend that. You won't really get that order of magnitude speed up you want. I would think PyCUDA, OpenCL, they would get you one or two, maybe more orders of magnitude. Number Pro does the same sort of thing. OpenMP4 is similar to what we had already, except it offloads things onto the GPU. So potentially, P range could give us a massive speed up without any added complexity. There's also distributed parallelism. So MPI, IPython, Spark, et cetera. I think a combination of these two would be really powerful. OK, so conclusions. It makes C extensions very easy. Uh, it offers excellent performance, especially in parallel. Uh, I'm also very impressed by Numba. Uh, they used to have a P range, but they removed it because it wasn't exactly stable. I have a feeling that'll probably come back in the future, but for now, there, there's no simple equivalent to Cython's P range. And here's some arbitrary scores I, I gave all these approaches. I think both Cython in parallel and Numba are probably the, uh, the shining stars here. But if you want simple code that still runs fast and your, your problem is uh, well tuned towards it, I think NumPy is, is the the default option. OK. Thank you. And there's some links. Oh, we've got a couple minutes for questions. And uh, the first question can be me. Um, what's the current state of play with Cython and Python 3? Oh, they, they work quite well, I think. Um, Cython has, as far as I know, full Python 3 uh, uh, compatibility. And so that's another reason to use Cython instead of, say, the C API, because there's a, a lot of differences under the core, but Cython abstracts most of these away. And so things like uh, Unicode strings, it's, it's quite easy in Cython. Yeah. In your work, is it generally obvious where the performance issue is, or is there profiling or tooling uh, that you use to figure out where your optimization should target? I should have mentioned this. I wasn't going to include a slide on it, but you know, of course, the first thing you should always do is, is profile. Uh, now, in these talks here, since they were based on existing uh, blog posts that were all about optimizing this particular uh, algorithm, 
it was sort of obvious where the bottleneck was, but definitely um, in our work, it's not obvious at all. Things you assume might be the bottleneck often aren't, and it's, it's other things. So definitely, it's, it's all about profiling. And I didn't really have time to go into that on this talk because it's only 20 minutes, but uh, Cython does give you some, some good tools for that. So, yeah. Uh, sure, I can. All right. So this is a very busy graph at the end. All right. Sorry, I have a question. Yeah, no. It is. Now it is a question. Um, so, so uh, looking at this graph tells me at the moment, and I'm not sure if I'm if I'm missing an important point, <coughs> is that <coughs> neither Cython nor number are considerably faster than NumPy at large array sizes? Uh, yeah, I would, I would tend to agree. I so mean, I, I, I mean, didn't I expect mean if this. If I look at small arrays, I probably don't need that level of optimization in many cases. So That's true. So I'm, I'm just trying to make a point for NumPy. Um, and, and yeah, I, I agree. It's, yeah. Um, I'm actually surprised to see uh, NumPy and, and all the other approaches be so similar. And it's one reason why I included a graph instead of just numbers for one array size, because you can see it depends greatly on, on what your array size is. So I'm, I'm definitely very surprised that NumPy is as fast as, as it is, because I would expect another order of magnitude speed up from going to C. And so either there's something wrong in my code where I'm, I'm testing these speeds, or over the past say, four years, there's been some real optimizations to, to NumPy itself, which is definitely very possible. So I, I actually agree. I think if your, your problem doesn't require you know, multiple cores and, and doing things in, in parallel, and NumPy is fast enough for you, then absolutely go with NumPy. Uh, the one condition on that one is if you're using lots of memory, uh, this sort of approach won't work very well at all. But we all knew that. <laughs> Tempted to finish the talk on Cython with just use NumPy, but is there any other <laughs> questions? <laughs> I think the parallel thing is pretty cool. That's only four cores. If you had 16 or 32, that would be uh, quite nice. Cool. Thank you, Chris, for telling us not to use Cython. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. You're welcome.